South Africa states that its applications concerns acts threatened, adopted, condoned, taken, and being taken by the government and military of Israel against the Palestinian people, a distinct national, racial, and ethnical group, in the wake of the attacks in Israel on 7 October 2023. South Africa contends that the acts and omissions by Israel of which it complains are genocidal in character because, I quote, they are intended to bring about the destruction of a substantial part of the Palestinian national, racial, and ethnical group, that being the part of the Palestinian group in the Gaza Strip. So this is the Corbett bombing. The Corbett bombing is a massive number of heavy bombs thrown at the same time at the same place. So they, they destroy everything and kill everybody and cut the roads of the civil defense and the ambulances so no one could survive even though if they were injured under the rubble. Not just this, their bodies will not be grabbed from under the rubble until after the war يعني, by months maybe. So the carpet bombing was used thousands of times this in this war and it destroyed uh, yani, a lot of neighborhoods uh, it killed a lot of people and unfortunately it's also used to be staged a uh, place like the Indonesian hospital like other hospitals and other places that were uh, besieged so just for your information this is the carpet bombing and tell me in the comments if the carpet bombing a war crime or not, if it's a genocide tool or not. President Biden, Mr. Blinken, Mr. Blinken, can you hear me? Prime ministers and presidents of the European countries, can you hear me? Can you hear the screams from Shifa Hospital, from al Hospital? Can you hear the screams from innocent people, refugees, sheltering, trying to find a safe place, being bombed by the Israeli attack forces this morning inside the hospital? Hospitals that are the temples of humanity and protection. When are you going to stop this? You're all complicit. So you have been, you know, uh, on the front line of this since the beginning, but you've also been, you know, UN special envoy and advisor to many, many, many issues. Yemen, Syria, you've been in UNICEF, you've been doing this for a long time, head of uh, relief operations, NGOs, the whole lot. Have you ever seen anything like this? Well, how do you assess what's happening right now in terms of humanitarian needs in Gaza? The worst ever. Christian, and I don't say that lightly. I mean, I started off in my 20s dealing with the Khmer Rouge, and you remember how bad that was, the killing fields and so forth. But 68% of the people killed in Gaza are women and children. They stopped counting the numbers of children killed after four and a half thousand had been counted. Nobody goes to school in Gaza. Nobody knows what their future is. Hospitals have become a place of war, not of curing. No, I don't think I've seen anything like this before. It's complete and utter carnage. Number two, the numbers, 11,000, 13,000, whatever it is, in Gaza, killed. The numbers displaced. Four out of five people alive in Gaza displaced. 1.6 million people no longer at their homes. I mean, of course, you can understand why Israel would want to challenge these figures, because they are so horrific, and they have led to such a global reaction. Gaza is a global crisis, as you know. It's not just a crisis about Gaza. It's a crisis about humanity. It's a crisis which affects politicians across the world. It's a crisis which brings people out onto the streets in great numbers. And it's a crisis which destroys our faith, built up over many decades, that war should not be the first option. And I'm 
terrified to see that in this case, that's not true. War has become the option of the day. And the suffering that comes from it is astronomical. Usually the most difficult part of proving genocide is intent, because there has to be an intention uh, uh, to uh, destroy in whole or in part a particular group. In this case, the intent by Israeli leaders has been so explicitly stated and publicly stated by the prime minister, by the president, by senior cabinet uh, ministers, by military leaders, that that is an easy case to make. It's on the public record. If we can allege that we see war crimes, crimes against humanity, as we have often done, there's no reason to exclude uh, where we see very strong evidence, the possibility of genocide uh, being committed. And I think you're going to be hearing that term more and more in connection with what we're witnessing in Gaza. I feel quite confident as a human rights lawyer in saying that what I see unfolding in Gaza and beyond uh, is genocide. showed a video on their social media of a young boy under slight sedation getting his foot amputated. He was awake and getting his foot amputated. According to the UN Humanitarian Agency, less than 4% of Gaza's emergent needs have been met. There are surgeries being done in hallways being lit by the batteries left in cellular phones. The United Nations Population Fund estimates that at least 50,000 pregnant women exist within Gaza, women delivering babies without any assistance. No access to running water, limited to no access to sanitation. There is exposure to raw sewage. There is exposure to the decomposing bodies for which there is no fuel to refrigerate and store them, setting up the perfect nightmare for the spread of infectious diseases like cholera, dysentery, polio, for which there is no treatment available. Today, the Palestinian telecom provider announced that Gaza is officially without internet. Millions of people without the ability to express the horrific atrocities that are going on right now to the global community, which is why it is of utmost importance that you continue to share, reshare, uplift the voices that continue to share these stories to help educate. Information is power. I'm going to collect organizations that I think are helpful and beneficial to provide assistance to, but I think voices are forever important. I don't know how, I, how else to describe this horrific, horrific nightmare. Um, I'm going to get back to work and come back with more information, if any, that I gather. Um, talk soon. Did he just call for the genocide of 
everyone that supports the Palestinian people. I can't believe I have to say this, but pa Palestinian people are not disposable. We are human beings, just like anyone else. My city, my grandmother, like all Palestinians, just wants to live her life with freedom and human dignity we all deserve. Speaking up to save lives, Mr. Chair, no matter faith, no matter ethnicity, should not be controversial in this chamber. The cries of the Palestinian and, ch Palestinian and Israeli children sound no different to me. Why? What? I don't understand. Is why the cries of Palestinians sound different to you all. A top UN official is resigning after 30 years on the job, saying the organization is failing to address what he calls a textbook case of genocide in Gaza. In a scathing resignation letter, Craig Mockaber accused the UN, US, and much of Europe of being wholly complicit in the horrific assault. This will be my last communication to you, he wrote to the UN's High Commissioner for Human Rights. He added, once again, we are seeing a genocide unfolding before our eyes, and the organization we serve appears powerless to stop it. He also wrote that the UN had failed to prevent past genocides against the Tutsis, Bosnian Muslims, the Yazidi, and the Rohingya. Now, he says the org is failing again. What you're seeing here is the aftermath of a bomb that was dropped on a Doctors Without Borders convoy in the Gaza Strip. That video was from November 18th, but yesterday, Doctors Without Borders released a report saying that all elements point to the responsibility of the Israeli army. They noted that two people were killed in what immediately appeared as a deliberate attack against clearly identified Doctors Without Borders vehicles. These were clearly identifiable medical vehicles that were deliberately targeted by the Israeli military as they tried to provide aid to injured Palestinians. Those medical vehicles being far from the only ones to have been targeted by Israeli occupational forces since October 7th. The Israeli military, as it continues its genocide in the Gaza Strip, has deliberately targeted medical staff, medical vehicles, and even hospitals across the Gaza Strip. This being a part of their larger goal to create maximal suffering for Palestinians in the Gaza Strip as they try to flee the ongoing violence that is being brought upon them by Israeli occupational forces. These bombings are targeting Palestinians who are seeking refuge in medical buildings, staff and personnel who are trying to help injured people, and those injured people themselves. It is a truly horrific element of Israel's ongoing genocide in the Gaza Strip, a genocide that has so far claimed the lives of more than 20,000 Palestinians. This is the reality of Israel's more than 75-year occupation and colonization of historic Palestine. Something worth thinking on. As always, free Palestine, and have a great day. We took very little staff robes. We took whatever we could. Yumna, are you okay? I'm okay, but the situation is extremely terrible. We have no electricity, we have no water, we have no internet. I could gather whatever I could gather in just a few hours for my children and all the families the same. It's not just me. This is how all the families are. And we could and we just took little little food and drink with us. And there's a shortage, an acute shortage of food in in, in the shops and in, in, in supermarkets everywhere. We can barely, like, we literally can barely find water and food and everything. We're just shut out of the whole world.
gonna talk about Farooq Al Khatib, this guy who is only 30 years old and from a town called Shredam in Ramallah. He was taken to the illegal Israeli prisons for only three months, and that's his before and after. This young man was taken into the Israeli prisons, the illegal Israeli prisons, and he was cut off the world. And especially after the 7th of October, there was no news about him. No one was able to communicate with him from his family. The only news the family received about him was from another hostage that was released before the attack started. Farouk was neglected treatment inside the illegal Israeli prisons. He was not fed. He was not given water. He was treated very poorly. And that what resulted on his appearance. On the 20th of December, he was released due to his physical conditions and his sickness that you can see in the picture. Before he was taken, he already had a problem in his heart. And after he was released, the family found out that he has gotten cancer in his intestines and stomach due to the medical neglection that was in the illegal Israeli prisons. <laughs> الأطفال في حالة هلع شديد في بيوت آمنين في بيوت تم قصفهم جميعا في بيوت آمنين أطفال أطفال كل شوية أطفال وشوية ونساء يعني نحن مش عارفين عن كل الدنيا صبايا في دفع This is very important. So this news channel, Khan 11, is Israeli state media. And they published an article with a man named Nico. He spoke of being at the Nova Festival in the most horrific of scenes. He said 29 of his friends had been killed by Hamas, described in details very disgusting actions of Hamas. I'm now going to read you the apology from Khan 11. It might be Khan 1-1, I don't know. After the broadcast became clear that the story told by Nico was not true. Before the broadcast, Nico's story was verified by some of the producers at the party, the caregivers of the compound, and some of the survivors. For six weeks, Nico received treatment and donations at the center established for survivors of the Nova party. After the broadcast, it became clear that the people who appear in the photos were not present at the party. They are healthy and intact, and we apologize for the heartache caused to them. Since then, Nico has not responded for comment. Motaz just posted this to his story about an hour ago, showing Al Azhar University, where he attended, completely being leveled. Has anyone else seen Mataz's story this morning? What in the dystopian war crime fuck is this? Civilian men stripped, lined up, and detained en masse. So the UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez invoked Article 99 of the UN Charter, which forces the Security Council to make deliberations over this humanitarian crisis. I'm continually asking myself the question whether these international organizations even have the ability to make any effective difference on the ground. What's appearing to me as really problematic is the veto power of the United States, China, the United Kingdom, France, and Russia. The United States is still signaling that it is going to block any ceasefire resolution put to the Security Council. So basically a country that has veto power, 
or a country that has the support of another country that has veto power basically has carte blanche to do whatever they want with little ability for the international community to hold them accountable or bring the conflict to a close. I mean, I never really had much faith in the international system, but what is increasingly becoming evident is that the system serves to entrench power rather than act as a counterweight to it. Israeli national security leader Giora Island just published an article in favor of genocide, arguing that Palestinian healthcare administrators, doctors, and other civilians should be considered valid military targets because they support Hamas. So Israel's not even trying to deny that they're bombing ambulances and hospitals anymore, they're just trying to justify it. Island even said that if there was a severe health epidemic in Gaza, he would cheer it on. That would be a good thing, because it would wipe out some of the Palestinian civilians who he sees as deserving of death, even though about 50% of them are kids. The article was published in Hebrew and it was titled, Let's Not Be Intimidated by the World, arguing that Israel should ignore the people who are disgusted by the fact that they've killed over 4,000 children and 11,000 people in the last five weeks and that they've been indiscriminately targeting civilian areas, refugee camps, hospitals, and other healthcare facilities. He's arguing that Israel shouldn't be intimidated into stopping their genocide. And this is a real Israeli government official, by the way, and he's pretty high up. These are the kind of people running the Israeli government, the kind of people who cheer on healthcare epidemics and explicitly argue in favor of genocide. If you have an Israeli flag in your bio, this is what you're cheering on. I can't believe I have to explain this to people, but this is a war crime. If you look at the Geneva Convention relative to the treatment of prisoners of war, persons taking no active part in hostilities, including members of armed forces who have laid down their arms, should be treated humanely. To this end, the following acts are and shall remain prohibited at any time and in any place. A. Violence to life and person, in particular murder of all kinds, mutilation, cruel treatment, and torture. B. Taking of hostages. You can easily make an argument that both sides are guilty of the first two. But then you have C, which is the main focus here. Outrages upon personal dignity, in particular humiliating and degrading treatment. And this clearly falls under that. Yet you have people like Ben Shapiro, who will literally defend anything Israel does no matter what, saying that it's okay. Even liberals like Noah Smith are pretending that this is no big deal. When called out for defending war crimes, he hit me with a quick War crimes are bad. Israel should not do this. Just because Hamas has committed war crimes as well does not give Israel the right to do their own war crime. 80% of all the people in the world who are currently suffering from catastrophic hunger are in Gaza. I'll say that again. 80% of all of the people on earth right now who are suffering from catastrophic hunger are in Gaza. This is far from the only war that is going on right now or the only incredibly violent conflict, incredibly dire situations that human beings are facing across the world. And Gaza is a teeny, tiny little strip of land, a teeny tiny strip where, what is it, 2.2, 2.3 million people are trapped. 80% of all the people in the world who are facing catastrophic hunger are there in Gaza. That was just one of so many incredible things that came out of South Africa's brilliant presentation of its case today in front of the International Court of Justice for Provisional Measures in the genocide case against Israel. So well articulated, so well put together. They did a really good job of relaying all of the details and the information as well as anticipating many of the arguments that Israel is likely to make and disarming them or otherwise just preemptively responding to these arguments that they are likely to make in advance. I was on a train barreling through the countryside and so there were a couple times when I lost signal and so I watched I would say solidly more than half of it but not the entire thing. I have a lot that I want to share with you and I have so many thoughts I've been like trying to write them down. I'm in an airport right now and I have to board my flight soon and I haven't had enough time to watch full, the full three hours um, and I'll have to wake up very early tomorrow, a few hours after I land, to watch Israel present its case tomorrow on Friday. But I'll be getting highlights to you as soon as I can, um, so please stay updated for that. The IDF claim they have now killed 60 plus Hamas operatives out of the current death toll of at least 10,000. So a 99.5% civilian death toll. 
spokesperson for the IDF said, we throw hundreds of tons of bombs on Gaza. The focus is on destruction, not accuracy. And we can tell. Don't let the media convince you otherwise. I'm not saying you should use TikTok as like your main source of information, but let's say hypothetically you did. Whilst 10,000 Palestinians die in the Gaza Strip, around 4,000 of them being children now, what are Israeli people posting to TikTok? Now, I don't want to be divisive here, but this is a nation at war. This is a nation that are terrified. They fear a second holocaust. So what is on their social medias? We have IDF TikTok dancers. We have soldiers kidnapping and blindfolding Palestinians from the West Bank and taking videos and making fun of them. We have IDF taking people from the West Bank and making videos and making fun of them on TikTok. We have colonial Israeli settlers celebrating the TikTok trend of kidnapping, beating and humiliating Palestinian civilians on TikTok. We have IDF dance videos. And we have regular citizens making fun of Palestinian looks and the fact that they don't have any electricity or water in light of the bombardment that Israel continued to do. So I'm not saying that you should use TikTok as your only source of information, but if you were to use TikTok as your only source of information, what can we infer from these images? Because the only thing that I've been seeing from Palestinian people when they can post because their internet's been cut off and their access to like telecommunications has been cut off are people struggling to survive. Are videos of family members digging their children out of under the rubble. People running through hospitals carrying their dead babies or dying children and like trying to save them. I'm seeing hospitals burn. I'm seeing universities targeted. I saw a press conference being held with literally the slain bodies at their feet after an Israeli airstrike. The doctors were literally addressing the media with dead people at their feet. So if we were just to use TikTok as a reference point as to who are the victims here, who would you infer as the victims based on what I've shown you? This is an excerpt from historian Matt Hastings' book in which he interviewed Netanyahu. In it, he wrote, at Bibi Netanyahu's dinner table in Jerusalem, I listened with crawling dismay to Bibi talk about the future of his country. In the next war, if we do it right, we'll have a chance to get all the Arabs out. We can clear the West Bank and sort out Jerusalem. He joked about the Golani Brigade, Israel infantry. So many men were North African or Yemenite Jews. They're okay as long as they're led by white officers. And he grinned. Hey everyone, it's been 68 days of continuous bombing, um, starvation, continuous displacement. And talking about starvation, I'm now telling you that people are now dying because of hunger. People are dying because there is no food. The day before yesterday, yesterday a child, a little girl, died in a school where the humanitarian aid trucks must go, where the food must be distributed. She died because of hunger. In Khan Yunis, in the south, she died inside a school, just just 20 kilometers away from Rafah crossing, where the, the, the aid trucks and the food enters Gaza. In the north of Gaza Strip, now this is in the south, there's no food, either in, in the schools and distribution and then uh, from the organizations, the the um, UN organizations or any other agencies or in the markets and in the north in the north of Gaza Strip yesterday a family ate a donkey yes yes hundreds of people in the same family not find anything to eat um, any vegetables any canned food any meat they ate a donkey Okay, for, for, for you, if you don't know, for us, this is really like ridiculous. How, how can anyone eat a donkey? People are dying because of starvation and because of thirst. There is no, there is no uh, uh, water, either clean water to, to drink or even dirty water to wash, to, to do anything. There is no water, there is no food. It's been 68 days. 
since the last time people felt that um, they're not hungry, they're not thirsty, and they're safe. There's no water. There's hey, this is four hours ago. Josh Paul, the director at U.S. Department of State, has resigned, y'all. Today, I informed my colleagues that I have resigned from the State Department due to a policy disagreement concerning our continued lethal assistance to Israel. To further explain, he also says, but I believe to the core of my soul that the response Israel is taking and with it, the American support both for that response and for the status quo of the occupation will only lead to more deeper suffering for both Israeli and Palestine people. And it is not a long-term American interest to the administration's response and Congress as well. This comes right after the hospital bombing. Let's talk about how we're going. If you are going back and forth with somebody in the comments to the point where y'all have your dissertations and it's like 20 plus comments, I'm blocking the both of y'all. Okay, y'all are not funny on my notifications. So apparently, I, I gotta talk about house rules again. If you are going back and forth with somebody to, in the comments to the point where y'all having whole dissertations and it's like 20 plus comments. I'm blocking the both of y'all, okay? Y'all are not funny on my notifications. So apparently, I, I gotta talk about house rules again. If you are, are going you, back and forth with somebody you, in the comments to the point where y'all having whole dissertations, right. and it's like 20 plus comments, I'm blocking the both of y'all, okay? Y'all are not funny on my notifications. So apparently, I gotta talk about house rules again. If you are going back and forth with somebody in the comments to the point where y'all having whole dissertations, Take your time. Mm. We, we can cut this out. Uh, people watching live stream. So, um, I went through the record of human shielding in great detail. And now I'm going to quote what Amnesty wrote. Okay, Amnesty International investigated the question. Contrary to repeated allegations by Israeli f officials, of the use of human shields, Amnesty found no evidence that Hamas or other Palestinian fighters directed the movement of civilians to shield military objectives from attacks. Can I ask you a question now? Yes. What if they didn't direct them? What if they mm -hmm. just put all their materials mm -hmm. where the other side would have no choice but to kill civilians. That, that's, a, that's a good question. That's a very fair question. If I can just repeat your question. He, uh, Noam is your name? Noam, yeah. Noam is making a distinction between what's, what you might call the strict definition of human shielding, where you conscript a civilian to protect you or protect others uh, from enemy fire. And then you turn to another possibility. The other possibility is, is Hamas locating itself in areas and firing from areas where it would be likely that civilians would be killed. 
And under international law, not to get into too many technicalities, under international law, that's called not taking sufficient caution to protect civilians. So let's look at what Amnesty International had to say about that. Oh, you were ready for it. Go ahead. Well, <laughs> as I said, yeah. I believe in facts. Absolutely. Okay? Absolutely. You, you believe let, in let, Amnesty International let, reports. Okay. Let, let's, let's see what Amnesty International had to say. The attacks that caused the greatest number of fatalities and injuries were carried out with long-range precision munitions fired from combat aircraft, helicopters, and drones, or from tanks stationed up to several kilometers away, often against pre-selected targets, a process that would normally require approval from up the chain of command. Now listen carefully to what Amnesty says. The victims of these attacks were not caught in the crossfire of battles between Palestinian militants and Israeli forces, nor were they shielding militants or other legitimate targets. Now listen carefully. Many were killed when their homes were bombed while they slept. Others were going about their daily activities in their homes, sitting in their yard, hanging the laundry on the roof, All right. when they were targeted in airstrikes or tank shelling. So when you, if you take is, just, is your contention If that... you take just the current Israeli genocide in Gaza, and I'll be perfectly willing to defend the term should you want me to. Please. In the current genocide in Gaza, the statistics, the statistics show of the 8,000 people thus far killed, 3,200 killed. What are you basing that on? Actually, I have it right here. Is it the Gaza <laughs> ministry? The number, no, 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 I'm sorry. I think I just said, Eli, it's very unwise, imprudent to use cheap tactics with me. It won't work. What's the chance? I just well, I just said, Eli, I would never cite a Hamas source. Excellent. Okay, so according to the most recent statistic, allow me one second. I have it. Um, how, do, how do they get statistics other than through Hamas? That's what I'm wondering. Well, uh, I'll get to that in a moment. Okay. In the last of the eight thousand killed. 3,000 children, over two-thirds of the casualties were killed in their homes. Now, According I'm, to... I'm going to get to that because I have no fear. I have no fear of truth or facts, none. Now, that was the Gaza Ministry of Health. That's correct. Okay, so you just the, told me... Yes, allow me to finish. Allow me to finish. Human Rights Watch... And several other, including The Economist, by the way, they have said that if you compare the statistics that are produced by the major human rights organizations with the ones produced by the Gaza Ministry of Health, that they are, there are very, what they said there was very... Comparable. They were comparable. They were close. Now, I have studied it closely. I have footnotes that take up three quarters of a page going through all the sources. And I would say, because people have asked me that question, if you were to put it on the spectrum, the Israeli numbers are at one extreme. And then at the other spectrum from the center over, they mostly cluster in the same area, including the Gaza Ministry of Health, However, I would say the Gaza Ministry of Health would be the highest. I will acknowledge that. But as all the human rights organizations have said, that there is no, I'll use the expression they use because it just came back to me, there is no big discrepancy between the Gaza, human, uh, Gaza Ministry of Health numbers and the um, numbers right. used by the human rights what, what, by, by what factor?
vast number of people in the Muslim community worldwide are powerfully deranged by religious symbols and their religious identity. I mean, this is the most important thing to them, more important even than the deaths of their own children. He says Muslim culture is powerfully deranged. Israel is committing a genocide in broad daylight, in real time, nothing concealed. Yesterday there was a headline in the Times, 90% of Gaza's population faces starvation. It's a human contrived starvation embraced by leadership in Israel, the United States government. But also, since we're talking about people who are powerfully deranged, one month into the Israeli genocide, there was a poll done, Time magazine, 57% of Israelis think that Israel is not using enough force in Gaza. Israelis all have access to the internet Internet, so they see all the same pictures as you see and I see. All of those kids, they think not enough force is being used. That's prima facie evidence of being powerfully deranged. So, for, you, for the purposes of today's conversation, it means most of those Palestinians who crashed through the gates of Gaza, it was their first time ever leaving Gaza. They were in their 20s. They had never seen anything except via the web. They had never seen anything of the outside world. They had been confined to this space for 20 years. That's not hyperbole. That's not exaggeration. About half of Gaza, half the population, for the past 20 years, has been unemployed. That figure or that percentage rises to 60% um, when you look at the youth. So now your audience should ponder, here is a population where a large part has been left for 20 years to just pace back and forth in an area that's among the densest, most densely populated in the world with nothing whatsoever else to look forward to. That's a fact. You get up each morning, there's no work, there's nowhere to go. You can't even try to look, emigrating. See what happens. Come to the United States. Come to France. No, can't leave. That's why David Cameron, the former British conservative prime minister, he described Gaza as an open-air prison. Baruch Kimberling, a respected Israeli sociologist at the Hebrew University, he described Gaza as the world's largest concentration camp, the largest concentration camp ever. The most of the water in Gaza is undrinkable, non-potable. Uh, a half of Gaza uh, is, by international humanitarian agencies, it's labeled severely strong and secure. Now, collect all these facts with one other fact. Every listener should remember, as Israel is now proceeding to annihilate, by their own admission, to annihilate all human life, in the nor all breathing life, in the northern sector of Gaza, that half of Gaza, half, comprises children. One half of Gaza are children. If you can imagine the accumulated rage 
the accumulated anger at being trapped, being born into the largest concentration camp ever. And then after 20 years, they have that moment where they can exact revenge on October 27th. Excuse me, October 7th. But that's still not the full picture. In fact, as ghastly as that picture is, it doesn't even begin to touch the surface of the reality. Because periodically, Israel launches these high-tech massacres on Gaza. And in the course of which, they kill very large numbers of civilians in operation cast lead from December 26th, 2008 to January 17th, 2009. They killed about 1,300, 1,400 Palestinians, 350 of them children, and demolished, leveled, flattened 6,000 homes. Uh, then that was called Operation Cast Lead. I'll skip a large number of other operations because time doesn't allow it. I will only say that try as I may, I can never remember the names of even half those murderous, high-tech destructions visited on Gaza. What Amnesty International called, it's not my title, bear in mind, after Operation Cast Lead, they issued a mammoth report titled 22 Days of Death and destruction. In 2014, July, August 2014, Israel initiated Operation Protective Edge. In the course of Protective Edge, it killed about 550 Palestinian children. It demolished 18,000 homes. The head of the International Committee of the Red Cross, Peter Maurer, is his name, M-A-U-R-E-R, -E for those of you listeners who wanted to check my what I'm saying now, it's the ICRC, International Committee of the Red Cross, Peter Maurer. He went to Gaza after Operation Protective Edge, as the Israelis called it. And he said, quote, in all of my life, I have never witnessed destruction on the scale that I've now observed in Gaza. I do teach international law. I teach the laws of war, or whether to characterize it as a genocide. On October 8th, three statements were made by Israeli leading officials. Statement number one was by Defense Minister Galan. Galan said, we're not going to admit any water, fuel, or electricity, or food into Gaza. Statement number two, we do not acknowledge any distinction between Hamas fighters and the civilian population. Statement number three is the statement by Mr. Netanyahu. He said, this is going to be a long war. It's going to be our longest war. Operation Protective Edge was 51 days. No food, no water, no electricity. So now you add those three statements up. 
I can't see how it's possible to conclude that Israel has launched anything except a war of genocide against the people of Gaza. Hello, my name is Norman Finkelstein. I'm an author and a teacher. I've spent the past 40 years researching the Israel-Palestine conflict. A crime is now unfolding in real time before our eyes. It is the crime of genocide. Israel has systematically targeted the land and the people of Gaza with total destruction. The U.S. government is abetting this crime. It has supplied Israel with the weapons. Senior U.S. military advisors are coordinating this genocide with Israel. The Biden administration has protected Israel from international censure. Senator Chuck Schumer is a leading architect and proponent of the genocide. Already in 2010, Senator Schumer stated that it makes sense, and now I'm quoting him, to strangle Gazans economically. Half of Gaza's population comprises children. Senator Schumer wants to strangle one million children in Gaza. I challenge Senator Schumer to debate the question. Should the U.S. support an immediate ceasefire in Gaza? The American people deserve to know the truth before their money is used to finance a genocide. Contact Senator Schumer's office and demand that he debate me. Thank you. Which side are you on? 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 There's a standard procedure that's gone on since 2005. A truce, a truce accord is established. Hamas lives up to it. Israel violates it, never keeps up to it. Finally, Israel escalates its violation. That elicits some kind of Hamas reaction. That's the pretext for the next act of what Israel calls mowing the lawn, another major attack, each one worse than the last. The 51-day war was the worst so far. That's the regular procedure. Then comes the Western propaganda just following Israeli Hasbara, uh, exactly what you reported. You know, poor Israel is attacked by rockets. What can they do? They have to defend themselves. It's, uh, it works very nicely. The great march of the return, which was people marching up to the border fence in Gaza, unarmed. Over 200 of them were killed, and hundreds of them were maimed by Israeli snipers. Snipers shooting at unarmed demonstrators. People say, why don't the Palestinians adopt nonviolent tactics? Well, the Israelis will gun them down in their hundreds when they do that, which is what happened to them, happens to demonstrations in the West Bank. They'll tear gas them, they'll beat them, and sometimes they'll shoot them. Um, attempts to do things like BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions are described as anti-Semitic. Well, you don't want us to use violence. What are we supposed to do? You go to the International Criminal Court. Oh, that's delegitimization of Israel. You would use diplomatic means. I mean, in other words, Israel systematically has blocked off every avenue, leaving the way open for Hamas, uh, in effect, to say, you wanted to negotiate, you failed. You wanted to create a Palestinian state, they wouldn't let you. Uh, we're going to try this. Doesn't mean that they're right or they're wrong, but it, it is the fact that no other option was left to the Palestinians. Uh, 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 it was clear that Netanyahu and his government intended to keep the Palestinians divided and under their control while they negotiated normalization agreements all over the Arab world.
The first part of the narrative is actually correct. The Palestinians did not accept the creation of a Jewish state in an Arab majority country. They did not accept the amputation of part of what they understood was their country to create a Jewish state. They hadn't created the anti-Semitism that drove Jews from Europe. They hadn't closed the doors to immigration to the United States and Britain and other countries which refused to take in Jews fleeing persecution, uh, like Balfour's Alien Exclusion Act or like the callous refusal of the United States to allow in Jewish refugees from Hitler before World War II. And they did not accept that they didn't have a right to self-determination in their own country. So no, they never accepted the idea of a Jewish state in a country which was overwhelmingly Arab. As far as Palestinians were concerned, it was their country. Um, and so the Palestinians end up being the victims of victims. And they weren't the ones who created the first group of victims in the first place. It was the, the, the virulent anti-Semitism of Christian Europe over millennia, culminating, of course, in, in the Holocaust. Um, the, the rest of the narrative is, is rubbish. Um, in other words, the Palestinians did not, it's correct, accept the idea of the creation of a Jewish state and the amputation of part of their country. In fact, the larger part of their country in the partition plan. The Palestinians owned uh, over 80% of the arable land and 94% of the total land of Palestine in 1948, 55% uh, of which that country was to be given to the, for the establishment of a Jewish state. It was a manifestly unjust partition, even if one accepted the principle of partition that a minority should get most of the country uh, was outrageous, but that was what the United Nations uh, 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 decided on, the United Nations General Assembly decided on. Um, thereafter, um, there were various attempts at a peaceful uh, resolution of this. The United Nations pushed Israel hard to accept the return of refugees, which the United Nations voted for in December of 1948. It said that refugees have the right to return and compensation. Um, and the United States and the international community tried to get Israel to return some of the territories that it had conquered that were to have belonged to the Arab state. And they got nowhere with that. So that wasn't a Palestinian rejection of a, a Israeli overture. That was an Israeli rejection of a, a, a proposal that would have uh, perhaps righted some of the wrongs of, of the 1948 war. Um, there were other attempts in, the, in, in subsequent years to make peace. Um, most notably, when the PLO changed its charter and changed its objectives and abandoned violence in the 1980s um, and tried to negotiate uh, for a, an independent Palestinian state. I mean, this brings us to a whole other discussion of why that state did not come into being. Um, but it certainly wasn't because the Palestinians weren't willing to live in a Palestinian state alongside Israel. Um, they were never offered a fully independent, viable, contiguous Palestinian state by any Israeli leader or by the United States. That was never on offer. I mean, I was involved in some of these negotiations and it was clear that what was on offer was, as Prime Minister Rabin said in his last speech in the Knesset, less than a state, i.e. an entity that was not sovereign and that simply enjoyed autonomy under overall Israeli sovereignty and Israeli security control. And that was the position that Israel and the United States have taken, really, in my view, uh, ever since the, the Palestinians were allowed to begin negotiating on their own behalf in the 1990s. So um, that the Palestinians turned down every offer is, is rubbish if one assumes that those offers included statehood and sovereignty and control of your own borders. They did not. Uh, neither neither uh, Rabin's offers nor later on offers that were made by Baha at Camp David, Prime Minister Barak, where, where Arafat and uh, Clinton uh, were, were, were negotiating with him, uh, nor a later offer by a later Israeli Prime Minister, uh, Ehud Olmert. None of them involved complete Palestinian sovereignty. None of them involved Palestinian control over their own borders. And if, if, if the argument is the Palestinians turned down a Palestinian state, that's false. They never were offered a sovereign, independent Palestinian state ever by anybody nor by the, uh, uh, by the uh, various Israeli prime ministers that I mentioned, and nor, in my view, by the United States. It was never really part of American thinking. American thinking was always tailored to whatever Israel considered the maximum. In my experience, the negotiations. But what is it like? Tell me, give me your thoughts and your So experience. everyone mistakenly thinks that Hamas like controls Palestine. That's not true at all. There's there's three different areas that were drawn up with the original partition. It's the West Bank, which is totally under military rule by Israel. And then there's the Gaza Strip, which is like the open air prison 
which they bomb the shit out of like every couple of years and Hamas controls that area. And then there's Jerusalem, which is an international city center um, that both Arabs and Jews live in. But the West Bank has been occupied militarily since 1967 and it's complete martial law. There's checkpoints. All political parties are illegal. You can't having a gun is like the least of it. You can't hold a flag. You can't belong to a political party. You literally can't do shit. If you're a Palestinian, you just have to sit there and submit. Um, and if even if you share a photo of someone who was like killed by an Israeli soldier, you go to jail and you go to jail for the amount of like months that. What? Yeah. Based on the shares and likes of the photo, they'll they'll. Pe OK, I'm going to read an open letter by Albert Einstein to The New York Times. And the reason I'm going to read it is because he and a bunch of other people were super angry about what was going on. And there's so many parallels with what's going on today that I thought it was interesting. Um, so it says, to the editors of the New York Times, among the most disturbing political phenomena of our times is the emergence in the newly created state of Israel of the, quote, Freedom Party, Tenuat ha Ha'erut, a political party closely akin in its organization, methods, political philosophy, and social appeal to the Nazi and fascist parties. This is Albert Einstein and others writing, okay? It's close to the Nazi and fascist parties. It was formed out of the membership and following of the former Irgun Zwei Leumi, a terrorist right-wing chauvinist organization in Palestine. The current visit, visit of Menachem Begin, and that guy eventually, that guy founded the Likud party, which Netanyahu is now the chairperson of. So Menachem Begin is who this letter is basically about. and. Uh, and um, that's okay. And he started the Likud party. The current visit of Menachem Begin, leader of this party, to the United States is obviously calculated to give the impression of American support for his party in the coming Israeli elections and to cement pol political ties with conservative Zionist elements in the United States. Several Americans of national repute have lent their names to welcome his visit. It is inconceivable that those who opposed fascism throughout the world if currently correctly informed as to Mr. Begin's political record and perspectives, could add their names in support to the movement he represents. Before irreparable damage is done by way of financial contributions, public manifestations in, public, in Begin's behalf, and the creation in Palestine of the impression that a large segment of America supports fascist elements in Israel, the Likud party, Netanyahu, but speaking of Begin, the American public must be informed as to the record and objectives of Mr. Begin and his movement. The public avowals of, Begin, of Begin's party are no guide whatsoever to its actual character. Today, they speak of freedom, democracy, and anti-imperialism, whereas until recently, they openly preached the doctrine of the fascist state. It is in its actions that the terrorist party betrays its real character. From its past actions, we can judge what it may be expected to do in the future. Then there's a section called Attack on Arab Village. A shocking example was their behavior in the Arab village of Deir Yassin. This village, off the main roads and surrounded by Jewish lands, had taken no part in the war and had even fought off Arab bands who wanted to use the village as their base. On April 9th, terrorist bands attacked this peaceful village, which was not military objective in the fighting. It was not a military objective. Killed most of the inhabitants, 240 men, women, and children, and kept a few of them alive to parade as captives through the streets of Jerusalem. Most of the Jewish community was horrified at the deed, and the Jewish agency sent a telegram of apology to King Abdullah of Transjordan. But the terrorists, far from being ashamed of their act, were proud of this massacre, the, Jew the, the, the Israeli terrorists, the Menachem Begin's party's terrorists. Far from being ashamed, were proud of this massacre, public, publicized it widely, and invited all the foreign correspondents present in the country to view the heaped corpses and the general havoc at Deir Yassin. The Deir Yassin incident exemplifies the character and actions of the Freedom Party. Within the Jewish community, they have preached an admixture of ultranationalism, religious mysticism, and racial superiority. Like other fascist parties, they have been used to break strikes and have themselves pressed for the destruction of free trade unions. In their stead, they have proposed corporate unions on the Italian fascist model. 
Now, is Einstein, Albert Einstein, prone to exaggeration? Is that how you become a good physicist? By exaggerating? Or do you actually seek out the truth and think real hard? So this is him writing and a bunch of other people. During the last years of sporadic anti-British violence, the IZL and Stern groups inaugurated a reign of terror in the Palestine Jewish community. Teachers were beaten up for speaking against them. That's happening now. Adults were shot for not letting their children join them. By gangster methods beating, window smashing, and widespread robberies, the terrorists intimidated the population and exacted a heavy tribute. The, the terrorists here are the party that um, Menachem Begin started, as far as I can tell. The people of the Freedom Party, Malcolm Begum's party, which he eventually started Likud. The people of the Freedom Party have had no party, have had no part in the constructive achievements in Palestine, no part in the constructive achievements. They have reclaimed no land, built no settlements, and have only detracted from the Jewish defense activity. Their much publicized immigration endeavors were minute and devoted mainly to bringing in the fascist compatriots. A new section is called D Discrepancy Seen. This is the last one before I'll read the names of the people who signed this. The discrepancies between the bold claims now being made by Begin and his party and their record of past performance in Palestine bear the imprint of no ordinary political party. This is the unmistakable stamp of a fascist party for whom terrorism against Jews, Arabs, and British alike and misrepresentations are means and a, quote, leader state is the goal. I don't know what that means, but apparently it's a big deal. In the light of the foregoing considerations, it is imperative that the truth about Mr. Begin, who started the party that Netanyahu is now the chairman of, and his movement be made known in this country. It is all the more tragic that the top leadership of American Zionism has refused to campaign against Mr. Begin's efforts, or even exposed to its own constituents the dangers to Israel from supporting Begin. The undersigned therefore take this means of publicly presenting a few salient facts concerning Begin and his party and of urging all concerned not to support this latest manifestation of fascism. fascism. Signed by Isidore Abramovitz, Hannah Arendt, Abraham Brick, Rabbi Jerison Cardozo, Albert Einstein, Herman Eisen, MD, Chaim Feynman, M. Gallen, MD, H. H. Harris, Zelig H. S. Harris, Sidney Hook, Fred Karush, Bruria Kaufman, Irma Lindheim, Nachman Meisel, Seymour Melman, Meyer Mendelssohn, Harry Olinsky, Samuel Pitlick, Fritz Rohrlich, Louis Rochter, Ruth Sagis, Yitzhak Sagowski, J. J. I. J. Schoenberg, Samuel Schumann, M. Singer, Irma Wolf, and Stephen Wolf. Netanyahu recently said Israel is fighting for all civilized countries and all civilized peoples, implying that the Palestinians are uncivilized, which is an old colonialist trope. And it's hard to even wrap my head around how stupid a statement like that is when Israel has bombed every university in Gaza. All 11 of them and 19 higher education organizations have suspended their educational processes. So Israel's bombing universities and healthcare facilities, which are like the pillars of modern civilization, the places where the Palestinians educate their young or care for the sick, injured, and elderly. Israel's blowing those places up and then claiming that they're fighting for civilization. You guys are destroying civilization. You're trying to wipe out an entire civilization of people so you can have their land. You just expect us to believe that they're uncivilized because they're a bunch of brown-skinned Arab people. What could be more uncivilized than bombing a school, bombing a hospital, bombing a refugee camp, and then lying about it to the world? That is the most uncivilized and psychotic thing I've ever heard of. Israel is waging a war against civilization, not for it. I get a lot of comments that are like, why won't you talk about this violent act by the Palestinians and why do you only focus on Israel? And I want to explain why. Whenever you consume mainstream media about Israel-Palestine, you get this narrative of two groups that are constantly at war with each other and that they hate each other and this is the reason that things are happening. And it completely removes it from the actual context, which is an occupation. Now, human beings simply do not give up their land for free. And because of this, in every settler colony, there always has to be an effort to paint the native as a barbaric people who want to kill the settler for no reason. The words of Chief 
Chief Justice John Marshall really summarized this. Now, he was alive in 19th century America, and what he said to justify the conquest of the natives was that the tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages whose occupation was war. This is exactly how the European settlers of America justified in their minds what they were doing to the native population. They painted them as these brutal people who were obsessed with war and simply would not coexist, when in reality the European settlers were far more brutal and also they were encroaching onto the native's land, which is obviously going to provoke someone because people simply do not give it up for free. And these two facts combined are why I don't talk about it that much, because ultimately the mainstream media will talk about this all the time, they will tell you, oh, the Palestinians have done this bad thing. And truth be told, I do not condone extreme violence. It is not a productive environment for anyone to grow up in, and it is not something that human beings do well with. Palestinians experience apartheid. This is a matter of fact. You can speak until you are blue in the face and try and deny it, but so many organizations, over 700 academics just a week ago, said that Israel is an apartheid state. The fantastical claim that all Jewish people are indigenous to the land of Palestine doesn't change anything, because ultimately, if you understood a settler colonial dynamic, you would realize that what matters is dispossession. It doesn't matter that the person from New York, Philadelphia, or some other place in Europe can say, well, actually, I have ancestry here. Ultimately, the native is still dispossessed, and this is what matters. And that's why I don't care about the people who leave millions of comments saying, well, actually, Jewish people are indigenous, because it changes nothing. Palestinians are not violent, bloodthirsty, hateful people. In reality, what they are doing is they are choosing to resist the colonization of their land and the horrors that they face every day at the hands of the Israeli regime. Saying that there are bad people on both sides and that this is the main obstacle to peace is completely ridiculous, because what you are comparing is a colonized country that doesn't even have a standing army to a military nuclear superpower with the backing of the United States. This is the head of research at OpenAI, the makers of ChatGPT, calling for the destruction of Gaza and the Jinn side of the Palestinian people. This person is in charge of research for one of the world's largest AI companies and is openly endorsing the murder of millions of people based on the classifier of where they are located. It is not a stretch to conclude that this type of racist foundational thinking would infect the systems that he is helping to design. It also isn't the first time that OpenAI has been accused of this kind of racism. According to a report from The Intercept last year, when asked to write a program that would determine whether a person should be tortured, quote unquote, OpenAI's chatbot answered, quote, if they're from North Korea, Syria or Iran, the answer is yes, end quote. The researcher that was interviewed for that piece concluded, quote, these outputs reflect choices of those companies. If a company doesn't consider it a priority to eliminate these kinds of biases, then you get the kind of output I showed, end quote. We also know that Israel has been using AI to produce automated recommendations for attacking targets. This use of AI has life and death consequences for ordinary people. And without knowing exactly what data is used to generate targets, Israeli officials are able to claim that they, quote, make sure as far as possible there will be no harm to non-involved civilians, end quote. However, experts in AI and armed conflict interviewed said that there was, quote, little empirical evidence to support claims that these AI-based systems reduce civilian harm by encouraging more accurate targeting, end quote. In fact, one source said, quote, the decision to strike is taken by the on-duty unit commander, some of whom were more trigger happy than others, end quote. So as we see, AI systems have real world consequences. And if their designers endorse racist, hateful ideologies, these biases show up in their automated decision making products. The clients, users and owners of these systems can then falsely claim that the decisions they ultimately make aren't discriminatory because a human didn't make the call. It was made by AI. And the civil and human rights implications of biased AI extend to all communities. A report by the Brennan Center for Justice reveals, quote, U.S. law enforcement agencies use AI to make critical decisions, impacting individual civil rights and civil liberties, especially those of immigrant and minority communities, end quote. This includes discriminatory predictive policing. And, quote, facial recognition technologies widely deployed by law enforcement lack accuracy in identifying non-white faces, putting black and Latino Americans at risk of erroneous matches, end quote. Anyway, I thought his public comments were really reflective of our culture of impunity for genocide and its open support that we see right now. And how folks in positions of power, whether political or corporate, can be so bold in their racism. Anyway, if you want to do something about it, uh, you can sign this petition demanding OpenAI 
remove this man from his position for being unfit to develop automated decision-making technology that will impact us all. I'll link the petition in the comments. As of right now, it has about 6,000 signatures. Good morning, everyone. So Israel has nominated a new chief rabbi for the Israeli diaper force. And these are some of the first things he discussed and uh, communicated to them. Right, just take a second to pause and read that. So Palestinians have been suffering under these kind of uh, rabbinical fatwas, the equivalent of that. Um, and fatwas have been used as propaganda as well. Unfortunately, this is the reality for the laws that are in Palestine, occupied Palestine, or what you would call if you were a Zionist Israel. Um, but I'm going to take a second to let you guys read this. And you could pause it and read it. But this is the religious text. These are the religious interpretations. And these this is what Zionists use to justify the atrocities that they commit. And that's why you'd... You, pretty much find Zionists are insensitive to the suffering that they commit to Goyim. It means cattle, anybody that's not Jewish. They don't view them as human. And that's precisely the issue. Um, now, there's a huge difference between Judaism and Zionism. Zionism is the equivalent of the Pharisees um, or uh, Tal and they follow the Talmud, which is the extremists' interpretation of the Torah. And uh, you'd come to know these people as the Pharisees back in the day who persecuted Jesus Christ, a Palestinian. God, that blows my mind every time I say that. And then um, the Talmud. Um, uh, people who follow the Talmud nowadays are called Zionists. Um, so Palestinians issue and uh, updated Hamas's new charter. So this is the updated charter of Hamas. Um, and you can pause it and read it. Um, but what it pretty much goes on to say is they just want, you know, freedom and dignity promotes all forms of injustice. Uh, they want to prohibit all forms of injustice and incriminates oppressors irrespective of their religion, race, gender, or nationality. Because Islam is against all forms of religious, ethnic, or sectarian extremism and bigotry. This is Hamas's charter. Now when you look at the IDF's nominated rabbi, chief rabbi, and he's calling for the rape of non-Jewish women, this is alarming. And, you know, let me just show you the, the, one of the other charters that kind of blew my mind. I've been reading the Hamas charter and reading the Talmud, and the picture is becoming very clear. So we have a text group, and I scribbled out their uh, profile pictures and, uh, you know, some of their names because, you know, I want to protect their privacy. But this is some of the things that shocked us last night when we were sharing. And I'm Palestinian, you know, so... We want to make sure that the side that we're advocating for is obviously, you know, with 100% certainty and conviction, we can advocate for them because we are not bigoted. We're not uh, incentivized to represent one side. This is of our own volition and of our own um, yearning for, liber uh, for liberation. But Hamas affirms that its conflict is with the Zionist project and not with the Jews because of their religion. Boom! That blows my mind. And then you got this guy. Israel's military has nominated a new chief rabbi who seemingly who seemed to imply in a past religious commentary that its soldiers are allowed to non-Jewish women in wartime. 
there's plenty of uh, cases to where they've done this in their prison systems, holding people without, you know, without charging them. The amount of sexual uh, assault cases that are filed against them. And they're never really followed up on by the Israeli courts because they follow the Talmud. Listen, again, don't believe anything I say. Just go look it up. Uh, I would encourage you to. I mean, this is like we've always known. Um, but this kind of just like puts it in front of you in context and you can actually expand on why they do what they do. Uh, another thing that they say in the Talmud, and I believe it's Sanhedrin 59, that if a goyim, me, even though I'm, oh God, I don't even want to get into the Semitic uh, history that I have and all that stuff, but a goyim is not allowed to research the Talmud. And if he inquires into the laws of the Talmud, he or she or whoever, they are punishable by death. Is that why I've been receiving so much death threats? Like, this is blowing my mind when I see that. There's another passage in the Talmud, and I'll get the exact quote, but if a, um, the person that believes in the Talmud, I don't want to say their name because I don't want to, you know, but if they, you know, if you believe in the Talmud, you are allowed to bound your neighbor. And if they die of starvation... You are just within the eyes of God and not to be held accountable. I've always wondered why they are so vehemently supportive of the starvation of Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. It's because these extremists that believe in this book, the Talmud, or the, the one that I referenced earlier, that is their faith. That is insane. That is a gross misinterpretation of their faith. Let's just say that. And that's why Jewish people are speaking out and advocating for Palestine. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From Zionism and hate and the liberation for all to return back to their homeland and live in peace and harmony. Free, free Palestine. Katie, the Jewish American, here with receipts and backup. There is a mythology that has proliferated that we lack consensus in academia and in scholarship about what's going on in Gaza. That it's not really a genocide, that it's not really settler colonialism or apartheid. And those darn academics just don't agree. That is a myth. That is false. Among human rights scholars, among international law scholars, Holocaust and genocide studies scholars, there is consensus on this issue. The myth that human rights scholars don't agree on what's happening in Gaza, that there isn't a consensus that this is an apartheid or a genocide, that's propaganda. That's not only misinformation and that it's incorrect, it's disinformation and that there is an insidious underlying goal to mislead people. So I'm gonna share you some receipts from the consensus. International Journal of Human Rights, Genocide in Palestine, Gaza as a case study. Descriptions of the genocidal impact of the destruction in Gaza beyond the physical. A Journal of Human Sciences piece published in 2011 after the siege on Gaza in 2008-2009 also clarifying that 2008 and 2009 themselves constituted an act of genocide against Gazans. A clarification of ongoing Gazan genocide written in 2010. Another explainer of the Gazan genocide written by Jewish activist and historian Elan Pape in 2006. A clarification of the continuity of the Nakba, that is the assertion that the Nakba itself didn't end in 1948. It began in 1948 and is ongoing, published in Holy Land Studies in 2014. A reflection in Jewish Quarterly by a Jewish scholar on the Gaza conflict, specifically clarifying the genocidal impacts of settlements in the West Bank. A post-October 7th, 2023 article written in The Lancet. If you are an academic, you know the reputation of The Lancet, written on the reclamation of our collective humanity by recognizing what is happening in Gaza as a genocide and as active war crimes. 
an article written in 2021 in Participation and Conflict on Settler Colonialism Without Settlers. This piece also explores the construct of slow violence and slow genocide. And these authors propose that Israel has done a radical thing in the history of settler colonization, particularly after the quote-unquote withdrawal from Gaza in 2005. These authors posit that what Israel is doing by blockading and bombarding and limiting water access and food access and movement of Gazans and policing them brutally via things like murder is managing to engage in settler colonization without the presence of actual settlers in the Gaza Strip. What Israel has proven, what Zionism has proven as a settler colonial project is you don't even need to fill the Gaza Strip with bodies. You just have to threaten with violence all of the people who currently live there. You have to do this with global impunity. You have to isolate them effectively from the rest of the world. And then over time, your settler colonial project will succeed. You will be able to claim that land. Just be patient. This piece on the way that Israel has weaponized access to water against Gazans. This piece about the way that Israel has targeted hospitals in Gaza since October 7th, published in Social Medicine. And this recently published piece in the Journal of Palestine Studies on moving beyond grief. And what this piece highlights is in the context of a genocide where you cannot even access your loved one's bodies, where you cannot engage in grief and mourning because you cannot access people to grieve or mourn. You have no way of placing them in the ground. You have no way of cremating them. You have no way of recognizing their movement to the next phase. When you cannot mourn the dead because you cannot reach their flesh, that instead you must exist in the context of a love ethic by fighting for their lives. It is one thing to endorse a population grieving their dead. It is another thing to endorse a population's right to fight for their lives. To anyone making the claim that there's really not consensus among human rights scholars about whether what's happening in Gaza constitutes a genocide, have you spoken to any human rights scholars recently? Have you actually talked to them? Who is telling you to parrot this point? It's disingenuous. It is disinformation. It is propaganda. I have just shown you a slice of the consensus. Point me to a single human rights organization, not a Zionist organization, not a political organization, a human rights organization that hasn't condemned the violence against Gazans right now. Point me to human rights scholarship, to international law scholarship that says, actually what Israel is doing is okay. You can't find those voices because they don't have the evidence to back up their claims. And if you have to scurry around and find a non-human rights scholar, just someone with a PhD, oh, say, in psychology, to say, oh, what, what Israel is doing right now is okay, that doesn't count. It doesn't count. They don't actually have the bona fides to be teaching you this, which is why I'm going to the actual scholars in this area. I'm a student, all right? I know to go to Google Scholar. I know to go to PubMed. I know to look for the experts. And I've been looking for the experts on Israel-Palestine. I have been looking for the experts on Gaza since around 2012. They have all told me the same thing. This is why we reject the premise of it's complicated. It's really not that complicated. You're just refusing to do your homework. And that's not actually on those of us who have chosen to learn. As always, free Gaza, free the West Bank, free Palestine, end the apartheid, end the occupation, end the genocide, and end the bombardment of Gaza. Do the required reading or get out of the way. Y'all really are obsessed with us. Like, what you mean a senator calls for a TikTok ban citing debate over war? Um, it's giving very much. They know what we're doing. They putting the pieces together on their own and they're teaching everybody. And now everybody is going to hate us because they know that we're actually evil and that we funded this war and that there's so much proof all over the internet. And we don't want y'all comparing notes because if y'all compare notes, then that makes y'all smart. And that means that our attack on the education of America didn't really work. Baby, no, it did not. Okay. I need y'all to know that our parents still taught us the correct information. Mm-hmm. Those of us that are actually indigenous, our parents taught us the correct information. And you know what we did? We started going out and teaching y'all kids. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. And we started waking up y'all kids. And y'all kids started coming to y'all demanding change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some of y'all. Some, some of y'all kids. Other ones decided to continue to profit 
um, from the history of taking from indigenous tribes. But then we decided to come on to TikTok and start providing proof because we got tired of being called liars. And we got tired of y'all trying to hide the facts from us. So Senator Josh Hawley, I know who that is. You, this, y'all, really, really, of all people, you know what? I knew this was coming because he... He was attacking. He was attacking someone in the DOJ not too long ago. But this, yeah, this ain't gonna work, baby love. This ain't gonna work. Um, everyone's sharing educational information, and the the quite literally the information that we're sharing. You guys were so arrogant that you put it on the internet for us to find, thinking that we were too stupid to look, um, and that we wouldn't find it ourselves. And what y'all really don't like is the fact that we had a front row seat. I'm talking popcorn and all to the crimes y'all committed. That's what y'all don't like. And before we find out what's really going on in the Congo, y'all trying to get TikTok banned and it ain't happening because we're going to find another way. We're going to find another way. We're going to find another platform to talk about it. We're going to find another way. It's so, I mean, do what you got to do, but y'all. And this is for November 7th that this popped up on NSNBC. They're trying to ban TikTok. Ain't that crazy? They see us finally making some good, some good content. We networking. We making some great connections. We're the next people in line to be, you know, changing things in this country. And he called to ban in a letter uh, addressed to the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who chairs the Committee of Foreign Investment in the United States, because this is a Chinese-based app. And in her, oh, sorry, interagency panel with authority to block foreign involvement in corporations and markets on certain national security grounds. What markets did it, did it, um, what markets? Because as far as I'm concerned, we just saw that there are several news outlets that are actually on this app. And it sounds like you're mad because y'all didn't win the PR war. That's what it sounds like. Because if that was the actual case, then our news outlets that are owned by Israeli Zionists that are funding these and the ones that the Western media that are telling the lies that we had to debunk, if that was the case, they would not be on here. But they are on here. And because nobody's watching it, and nobody's believing it, and the sales are tanking on those broadcasting shows. Y'all want to get rid of TikTok? Be for real. If y'all gonna be anything in a world where you could literally be anything, y'all chose to be a clown. Like the lies, the lies, the lies. Y'all more delusional than Donald Trump himself. Like I used to think, like, how did Donald Trump get all the way to the White House? This is how. This is how he sold them mofos a dream and baby, they bought it. And when <laughs> they realized what that man had done, he hopped, skipped, skedaddled his behind all the way to the Florida Keys with all of their personal information. And by the time he got there, he done already told everybody their business. So the business is just floating all around. How you think the Taliban got... Ooh. We already talked about that another day. But... We know what Donald Trump did. We know why he in that office. Or why he under in, being indicted right now. Because he got y'all secrets. He got y'all secrets. <laughs> it's going to come out one way or another. Baby, my grandma used to say, but don't come out on the wash phone. Come out on the rinse. So, do what y'all got to do. We going to find a way to talk to each other. We going we gonna to find a way to get the messages out. Okay? <laughs> y'all watch out. They coming after your pockets. Meanwhile, in Palestine, outside the all-Jewish city of Tel Aviv, two mines partly derailed the Cairo Haifa Express. Alleged to have been planted by members of the Irgun gang, police arrested two men immediately after the attack. The Jewish engine driver of the train was killed. British troops traveling in two of the five derailed coaches were not seriously injured. Irgun have threatened to destroy every yard of railway in Palestine. I've talked about these guys before, but today is the worst day it's been in a while. My family lives in the West Bank in a village called Budin, and above the village is an extremist Jewish settlement called the Yitzar Settlement. They're the most radicalized extremist settlement in the West Bank, and they've unalived my family, they attack us, they've been doing this for years. The Israeli government gives free protection to Jewish settlers in the West Bank. This is my grandfather's house in Budin. This is my grandparents' door in the West Bank. Every door is like this, and it's double-sided because the Yitzar Settlement will come down and raid the village. 
village in the middle of the night. This circled house is the last Palestinian house anywhere near that hilltop. A family with kids lives in there, and they've always been attacked by the Yitzhar settlers, but they came down today and they told them they're going to unalive them if they don't vacate that house this week. I asked my cousin to reach out to them and send me photos of the inside of their house because it's completely barricaded in the inside because they're scared shitless. I keep talking about it because I'm scared for my family, but the media just won't publish about the extremist settlers in the West Bank, the Yitzhar settlement specifically. It's a small settlement, it's like around 2,000 people. They even attack the IDF. These guys are crazy. I keep asking my cousin, what can I do? Can I give you money? How can I help? And she keeps telling me the best thing you could do is just to have more of the world know about these extremists. They've had case studies written about them. They're psychotic. This is not spoken lightly. Here in the United States, the Christian Zionist movement, John Hagee, go down the list of them, Perry Stone, Lance Wallnau, Stephen Strang at Charisma. You go down the whole list of Zionist puppets are clapping and cheering for this atrocity. They're delighted. I mean, this is just so incredibly disingenuous on their part. Jesus Why aren't they crying for peace? Be peacemakers. Why aren't they calling for peace? Why aren't they negotiating? Why aren't they putting pressure on Israel? You have to stop treating the Palestinians like they're animals. You say you're the children of God, but you treat the Palestinians like they're rats. Why aren't these Christian leaders telling the Jewish Zionists, this is ungodly. You say you're the chosen people of God. You can't behave like this. Do you remember the 43 students that went missing in Mexico back in 2014? Did you know that one of the government officials, Tomas Ceron, who is accused of not only covering up the investigation, but also tampering with evidence and torturing witnesses, lives in Israel? The abduction of the 43 students is considered one of Mexico's worst human rights violations in its recent history. Not only does the man who covered up that whole investigation, Tomas Seron, live freely in Israel, visiting nightclubs frequently and upscale restaurants, as locals say, the Prime Minister of Israel refuses to extradite him back to Mexico, even after AMLO has asked for him twice now. So not only does Israel commit its own disgusting war crimes, it supports the war crimes of other countries as well. Tomas Seron is not the only criminal that seeks refuge in Israel. Do you know how many sex offenders live there? This is your daily reminder that Israel is the only country in the world, the only one that tries children in military courts. Yes, children, three-year-olds up to 17-year-olds. They prosecute between three to 500 children every single year. Look, guys, you have to understand how medieval this is. Imagine a five-year-old has thrown a rock at you and you've collected them from their house and they put them in handcuffs and in many cases they put blindfolds and they beat these children. I'm not even going to get into the R word where there are documented cases which have been published by the Israeli government, may I add, where they are these children. What kind of country or government are you back in if you're from England that persecute and trial children in courts? Have you got kids? Could you imagine your kid? being brought to court and being put in a prison and being physically and sexually abused. This is a really, really twisted, twisted government. And if you're backing this, you need to give your head a wobble. So I was doing a little Googling and this popped up. Palestinian children tortured used as shields by Israel, UN. And this is from Reuters, by the way. The UN was accusing Israel of using Palestinian children as human shields and informants. Israeli soldiers had used Palestinian children to enter dangerous buildings before them and to make them stand in front of military vehicles to deter stone throwing. In this report, there's only one set of soldiers who got in trouble for forcing a nine-year-old to search a bag suspected of containing explosives. They received a suspended sentence of three months and were demoted. Some of this article points out that Palestinian children are arrested and accused of having thrown stones, which carries a penalty of up to 20 years in prison. And then I found this article. The use of civilians as human shields is prohibited under international law. The practice is also prohibited under Israeli law based in a 2005 ruling. Why did Israel need to make a law about that? <laughs> Israel High Court bans military use of Palestinians as human shields. October 6, 2005. <laughs> I mean, if this isn't like the biggest projection you've ever seen, I don't want to hear another thing about Hamas using Palestinians as human shields. They're just mad that the UN called them out on it first. Okay, okay. And then after that, the IDF got upset about the ruling that they can't use Palestinian human shields, so they asked the high court to review the ban.
And this whole thing just went sideways because I was just researching the children who were in detention centers in Israel. But then I come to find out that these children are being used as recruited to work as informants, extort their families financially, force them to pay large financial fines. It's so easy to dehumanize somebody when you have all the power of propaganda by calling them a terrorist, when in reality, you're the one exploiting them, abusing them, extorting them and their families. What's that saying that's going around right now? Israel's losing the PR campaign? Mm hmm I love this for you. But where are the Israelis gonna go? Back to wherever the fuck they came from or they can integrate. Live under Palestinian sovereignty, get a Palestinian citizenship, passport. It should be one country called Palestine where all religions live together as it used to be. Peace and harmony, but you guys ruined it. These Western news organizations are not only complicit in this genocide, they're criminal, they're acting criminal. From Canada with the CBC reporting that um, state Israeli violence is different than Hamas because they only act remotely. Remotely, phosphorus bombs, carpet bombs, the Gaza Strip's annihilated. The only remote act that they did was in Beirut. Um, we're not blind. We are not that ignorant. You're putting the public at great risk by not telling us what's going on. CNN here today finally reported, oh, the Gaza Strip's uninhabitable. That was it. Wow, 80 days later, while over a hundred real journalists have been slaughtered, you are at your desks doing nothing. You are the scourged, the damned, and you need to be held responsible. Um, I'm Palestinian, I've never been to Palestine. I can't go to Palestine. If I want to go to Palestine, I need to apply for a visa visa from the Israeli embassy. I refuse to do that. My family refuses to do that. For the past month, and five days, everyone's been asking me, how are you? It's a question I no longer know how to answer. How am I? How are you guys? I'm not okay. I haven't been okay. None of us are okay. And yet we have to live and we have to move on and we have to go on with our jobs and our lives and see our friends and go to restaurants and move on as if nothing is happening and it makes my blood boil because no one gets it. And I will sit at work or at uni and I will speak to my colleagues and the people that I work with and study with and live with and they will say, oh, don't worry, we understand. No, you don't. No, you don't understand. You don't understand and you never will because you are not Palestinian and you haven't been stripped from the right of living and visiting and seeing your land and seeing your people. I just want to go eat knafe in the streets of Nablus. I can't. I can't and it makes me mad and it makes us all mad and no one gets it. So please, please stand with the people of Palestine, please. We need your support more than ever. We need it. We haven't seen a day of peace for over 75 And then they came for the Palestinians. And I was not a Palestinian, so I did not speak out. And then they came for the Muslims in Britain and elsewhere. And I was not a Muslim, so I did not speak out. And it's about the need to be committed and express solidarity at that first moment with our fellow human beings, whoever they are. And it's more than just a poem of principle. Even with all the despicable stories that we've seen out of Gaza in the past few weeks, this one got to me. This mom posted, finally managed to do a birthday party for my daughter despite everything. Her happiness was worth the world. And this is from the Twitter account of an English instructor in Gaza who was clearly struggling to get by as she was asking for donations for water and electricity. But she hasn't posted in three days because she died. Uh, Israel killed her. Shortly after she threw this little birthday party for her daughter. So now this little girl's alone in Gaza without access to food, water, or electricity because her mom was slaughtered by the Israeli regime. And there are just no words for this. Part of what I do for a living is teach little kids about this age how to wrestle. 
And the fact that this is being done to five-year-olds with our tax dollars. The Biden administration is calling anyone who wants peace disgraceful and repugnant. It's just appalling. It's disgusting. Like, do you people worship death? I will never vote for Joe Biden. I will never vote for anybody who agrees to fund this genocide. I'll vote for a candidate once they call for Bibi Netanyahu to be tried at the Hague for crimes against humanity. I say this as an American Jew. My children go to Jewish day school. I lead services in an Orthodox synagogue. Judaism at the center of my life. The first time I went to spend time with Palestinians in the West Bank, it was a shattering experience. The only thing I could imagine would be similar for Americans would be going to visit the Jim Crow South. When you see people living under the control of the state with no rights, they cannot become citizens. They cannot vote for the control for the state that controls their lives. They do not have free movement. They need a pass to move from city to city. They live under a military legal system. The consequences are more brutal than we can imagine sitting here. So do I agree with MIFTA? Of course not. I had a close friend who was killed in a suicide bombing. But Palestinians don't. You could have made the same argument if you went to visit SNCC and said, oh, they were connected with communists. Some of their people have made anti-white statements. The point is, what Ilhan Omar said is the, tr is the most important point. People need to go and see for themselves. I've never seen anyone who's gone and seen for themselves and not been transformed by the experience. Swedish diplomat Count Folke Bernadotte was appointed as UN mediator in Palestine. His mission was to seek a peaceful settlement. Count Bernadotte surveyed the devastated Palestinian villages and visited refugee camps in both Palestine and Jordan. In a report, he wrote, It would be an offense against the principles of elementary justice if these innocent victims were denied the right to return to their homes. On September the 17th, 1948, the day following his UN report, the motorcade of Count Bernadotte was ambushed in Jerusalem. He was shot at point-blank range by members of the Jewish Stern Gang. Here's a clip from an actual class in Israel. Listen to what the kids say, but more so, look at the expressions and the reactions of the adults in this video. I've heard so many people say that real change can never come from within the Israeli society, which is why pressure from the international community is so important. The Palestinian struggle is not just a cry for justice. It's a blistering battle for the most fundamental human rights that every living soul on this planet should inherit by birthright. It's an unyielding resistance against the oppressive, suffocating grip of occupation and the callous denial of the most basic human dignity. Just as the civil rights movement in the United States fought against the chains of racial discrimination, so too do the Palestinian people strive to shatter the chains of occupation and tyranny. Never forget, my friends, that the Palestinians, much like African Americans in the United States, have been subjected to a heart-wrenching history of suffering and torment. The birth of Israel in 1948 brought forth the mass expulsion and dispossession of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians from their ancestral homes and land. This is a historic injustice that continues to haunt the lives of Palestinians to this very day. The situation in Palestine serves as a brutal reminder of the consequences of colonialism and the ruthless dispossession of indigenous people. 
It is an agonizing reminder that the fight for justice knows no borders, and we must stand united in solidarity with all oppressed peoples, whether they reside in the United States, South Africa, or anywhere around the world. Let's be unequivocally clear. Advocating for the rights of the Palestinian people is not synonymous with denying the rights and security of the Jewish people. The fight for justice in Palestine is not an assault on any particular group, but an unwavering stand against the policies of a Zionist state that has for far too long stripped Palestinians of their rights. We must remember that numerous Jewish voices also resound in the calls for justice and peace in Palestine, and their voices must not be silenced. In our relentless pursuit of justice for the Palestinian people, we must also acknowledge that it is in the best interest